there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, Lord. sometimes it causes me to tremble. I, I'm hearing things. Usually I'm not hearing things. This time I am hearing things. Yes. Just a closer walk with thee. How about the, the uh, first verse in chorus? I, oh, okay, which, where do you want it? You got to agree. <laughs> That'll work. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to. 
I'm a little, did, is someone on for a special tonight? Now, I know there was one scheduled, but there's been sickness and um, they're away from here, and I think I'm not aware of anyone who's taken their place. Would you indulge me if I sang a song? It's just, just a, no, I'll, just a, it's just a little, it's a acapella song, if I remember it. It came to mind, I've been thinking about, about my neighbor. It's coming up to the anniversary of her husband committing suicide. And he wasn't a believer, wasn't a believer. She's not, she has a church background, but not a believer. It is so different. You know it's different if you're in Christ. The hope that we have. And no, no fear of death. Sure, we choose a way to go if we could. There are some ways I'd rather not go. But the fact of going, it's, it's something we can anticipate. And even more so the Lord coming and, and taking us to be with him. You'll know the scriptural passage that it's, it's taken from. <clears throat> and I'm not even sure where to pitch it, so if it gets squeaky, it does. I'm sorry. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrowed not as others which have no hope. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord for Thank you, John. We appreciate that very much. Uh, we've really been noting throughout the course of the day how significant it is that we are in Christ and, and that that makes all the difference in the world and what a great prospect for God's people. Uh, John just sang of the rapture of the church and we're longing for that day. It could even be tonight and for that we are glad. And it certainly is a necessary backdrop to us receiving Christ's instruction, and uh, so that is a good segue into our time of study. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are good and gracious, and we have come to worship you again tonight. We are prompted at every turn to think of your precious promises, and one of the most special ones is the promise of your return. It's called by the theologians the rapture of the church, the day when Christ comes and gathers to himself all those who have put their faith and trust in him. What a great hope. What a wonderful prospect. And when we think about such wonderful events, such precious promises, it really warrants our being diligent and living out our lives now 
in such a way so that this coming one would be pleased with us. So really two things. One, that we would have a personal relationship with the coming Lord. That's salvation. And then that we would be in the process even now of ordering our lives according to the Lord's teachings. That's sanctification. And James, the writer of the epistle we have the privilege of studying, certainly is doing his part. So help us, Lord, as we listen ultimately to you as you continue to talk to us about our tongues. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, James, in his epistle, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, is talking to us about our tongues. I remind you that he paints six pictures, uh, two pictures that set forth the tongue's power to direct, two, the tongue's power to destroy, and two, the tongue's power to to delight. Good news is coming. We're about, uh, uh, oh, maybe just a little bit more than halfway through. We have been looking at the two pictures which set forth the tongue's power to destroy, where James likens the tongue and the words that drop off from our tongues to destructive fire and deadly poison. Let me remind you of uh, that by way of reading. So James Chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Here we go. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire in a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. By the way, James has really prompted us to be in tune with what I just read in verse 8 throughout the course of our considerations of this rather lengthy section that the tongue, frankly, is untamable, And that really prompts us to run to God. Really prompts us to lean on his everlasting arms. It really pushes us to trust Christ on a daily basis. Because what is impossible for us on our own is certainly possible with the Lord Jesus Christ, our trusting him. I have to tell you one of the neatest personal testimonies that I receive in regard to any of the studies that we are conducting is the testimony, for instance, in this case, where more and more God's people, and certainly this is my testimony to you, that we're just being more careful about our tongue. We're being more careful about our words. Now, James isn't done. Again, we're a little more than halfway through, and we have some things yet to consider that are difficult, but uh, things are about to get good, and for that we are glad. Uh, Tonight, before we leave the two pictures which set forth the tongue's power to destroy, we have some tough terms to deal with. Can you believe what James says here about the tongue. When you read it, you say, oh my, I hope this is hyperbole. I hope that this is an intended exaggeration because James uses very grave words. And if it's not hyperbole, then we're probably going to be getting knocked on the seat of our spiritual pants And uh, I I do have to insert here that we have no hyperbole. So again, James' teaching is strong. And for that, ultimately, we are glad. Take a look at verse 6. It's really what I'm referencing. I'm rereading verse 6. It says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. 
So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. My. At the top end of the verse, James writes this. The tongue is, quote, a world of iniquity. I've noted this with you before. I do so again tonight, and we'll probably do it again before we're done studying our way through this section. There are certain times in our study of James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, where you're certain that the call of God on our lives is to absolutely shut our mouths. When you hear that the tongue is a world of iniquity, within that specified observation, we would say, my, I don't know that I even want to open my mouth. Now, what's interesting about that is we do open our mouths. I've never met anybody, regardless of how far and how deep they've gone in the study of uh, of uh, the word of God as it pertains to the tongue. I've never met anybody who has decided to simply stop speaking. And isn't it interesting that in light of all of the warnings, and that's why I'm not sure that I have fully grasped and embraced God's instruction here, isn't it interesting that if we have a problem with our tongues, that almost always it's where we speak too often and too often the words that we speak, again, are ultimately displeasing to the Lord. you got to continue to see this instruction within the backdrop of the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We have a lot to say. We have a lot of valuable words. And so God's people need to continue to speak their peace, not their peace. They need to continue to speak the Prince of Peace's peace. And we need to continue to open our mouths. And by the way, in regard to the ministry of the church, it's interesting to me that when God instructs his people... <clears throat> as to how we're to operate within the confines of the ministry of the local church, that the vast majority of his instruction pertains to our words. That we would be exhorting one another, that we would be comforting one another, that we would be encouraging one another, that we would be praying for one another. So James, again, I'm just noting it in passing. He's not looking for us to give up our career in speaking, but rather to continue to monitor our words and to make sure that our words are pleasing to the one who made the tongue. Hmm. James says the tongue is a world of iniquity. The Greek word behind the English word world is cosmos. This is interesting. The Greek, you've heard cosmos. It's usually pronounced cosmos. You hear that even from scientists as they think about and, and, and uh, testify to us that, that they're exploring the, the cosmos, for instance. And we said a couple of things this morning that Help us to understand that in regard to even our space program, we're kind of like the ant that climbed up one stalk of grass and then looked down to his buddies and said, hey, I'm exploring the world. Did you know that if you could invent uh, and create a spacecraft that would travel 10 times the speed of light, by the way, scientists, even secular, recognize that it's impossible to make a spacecraft that can travel the speed of light, which is 168,000 miles per second. If you could times the impossible by 10 
it would take you still 10,000 years to cross our galaxy, the Milky Way. And to think that our galaxy is one of perhaps a trillion other galaxies in the universe, you are talking about a great God who has unfolded a vast expanse of space with miraculous creations at every turn. James says the tongue is a world of iniquity, and the word world is the Greek word cosmos. It speaks of a, an ordered and arranged system. The terms are very important. This is striking. You, you can make all kinds of observations, and again, some of you are, well, I guess probably all of you are ahead of me in the realm of thinking, and I suppose that it would almost be unending the appropriate observations and applications that we would make to this. But I'll offer to you a simple one or two. Don't miss this. Every single word. Talk about pictures that James is painting. God's the master painter, by the way. So it's God who's doing the painting. But, but talk about pictures that are painted for us. Every single word we speak is tied to one of two worlds. Every single word we speak is tied to one of two arranged and ordered, listen to the word, systems. If you're thinking that one of the lessons we're about to be reminded of is where our words get plugged into something bigger than the word itself, then you're right on. In fact, I think I will say in the end that that is one of the very significant things that James is doing with us. He's prompting us to look at our little tongue and the little words that drop off from our tongues, and he's helping us to see the big picture of the thing. And here you could read right over it that our word, each and every one, gets plugged into a world, an arranged and orderly system. Now you're saying, Pastor Tom, what's the point? And you will answer that for me by answering this question. All you need to do to appreciate what we just said is to ask and answer the question, who, are, who is the prince of each of these two worlds? And of course the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ is the prince of the world of righteousness. And Satan is the prince of the world of iniquity, which James references here. In other words, we'd be amiss if we didn't recognize our arch enemy interwoven through each of these words. I realize that we have the tendency to put Satan in places where he isn't, and I realize that we have the tendency to blame him when we shouldn't, but the fact of the matter is our enemy is alive and well. And when it comes to evil speaking, please know that there is in the mind of God a direct tie between an evil word and the evil one. Satan. And I mentioned this to you before, and I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but sorry, I can't help that. I, last week we noted that Satan will take an evil word that's spoken by a child of God. It's still, you, you know, we ought to be shocked by that. That, that. that the children of light can actually speak darkness. And just in that observation, we ought to have enough motivation to make sure that evil words are not dropping from our lips. But we noted last week that 
Satan loves it when a child of God speaks an evil word. It's, it's like, wow, you can imagine if we could personify the whole thing. It would be where he'd be running around with that word and he would be saying to other worldlings, look at the word that has come from the child of light. And tonight I believe that we're going to be adding to that picture because now all of a sudden with this phrase, the world of iniquity, we, we, we all of a sudden are picturing something like Satan taking that word and just squeezing all of the iniquity he possibly can out of that word, making it work for him. Making it count. This is not hyperbole. Making it count for hell. Not heaven. The reason why James speaks of hell here is because interwoven through all of these words and phrases is, the, is, is our arch enemy, Satan. And you can't talk about Satan without talking about hell, which is his final abode. I wish I could tell you that there's hyperbole here, but there's not. I realize that you and I, having put our faith and trust in Christ, certainly are not heading to hell, but sadly, we ought to weep over it. We can speak hellish words. God, help us. When we speak an evil word, it fits in with, flows into, and feeds an entire world of iniquity. And Satan is the prince of that world. By the way, the Greek word here, uh, hell, j just so you understand, James is not throwing words around. It's a Greek word, Gehenna. And what's interesting about it that we saw as we took a look at the original language is that the definite article is accompanying it. So James is talking about the hell, just in case you're wondering. The hell, the place of eternal punishment, Satan's uh, future home, according to Matthew 25 and 41 and Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. Again, we're not heading there. Glory, hallelujah. We're on the road to glory. Glory, hallelujah. We're, heaven is our eternal home. Again, glory, hallelujah. But sadly, you and I can speak as if we're not going to heaven. Please, God. Please, God, help us. I want to take you someplace else, a, a, a sister text. And what I like about this, and you may not catch it, and if you don't, it's my fault, not yours. A, a sister text that not only uses some of the words that James uses, but a sister text that uses some of the words that we've been using as we've discussed James. That's about all I want to say to you. You're keeping your finger here because we come right back, but we're turning back to Ephesians chapter 2. Wow, I can hear a few Bibles out there. Ephesians chapter 2, got to read it carefully. I, I think you probably ought to read it two or three times over, but just once for now. Again, talk about where we used to be and what used to mark us. And Ephesians 2 and verse 1, the first three verses. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Watch this. Wherein in times past ye walked, notice the terms, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, that is our way of life, and certainly the words that accompany such way of life, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And to think that our words, in a very practical way, can take us back to such scenario. Again, 
we have all the motivation we need to make sure that our words are pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now back to James. Uh, there's one other very curious statement here that I wanted to note with you, and so I'm rereading verse 6. And the tongue is a fire and a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. This is interesting. This phrase, the course of nature, Commentators really don't know what to do with the phrase, and to a lesser degree, the translators. You understand why, as I share with you the Greek words that we have here, two primary words in particular. The word course in the original language is the Greek word genesis, or genesis. You actually know that word. It means beginning. As in Genesis, the book of beginnings. So we have the Greek word here, Genesis, which means beginning, or when it's applied to life, it often means birth. So beginning or birth. I'm just going to give this to you by way of translation challenge and see what you come up with. The, the, the word course is the, is the Greek word Genesis, which means beginning or birth. And the, the word nature is the Greek word trakas, which means a will. Sorry, my Michigan accent. By the way, whenever I mispronounce anything, I always reference my Michigan accent. I have no idea if that actually helps me or not, but it's worth a shot. A wheel. W-H-E-E-L. Here's your translation challenge. Here's the phrase. The birth of a wheel, or the beginning of a wheel. Now, the word wheel, that's the literal translation. It does has, have a figurative uh, use, and you certainly won't be surprised by that. When it's used figuratively, it speaks of a circuit or a um, course of travel. But here's your challenge, and you, so you can appreciate both from the standpoint of the translator and then later from the commentator, what exactly is God saying here when he uses this phrase, the beginning or the birth of a wheel? Now, it's interesting. Uh, we, we have some good translations. Uh, some of the translations, and I actually personally appreciate this, there are times when the translators don't do so much translating as in just bringing over into the English the, the very Greek word. In regard to translations, and I think it's a good one, for instance, I checked out the NIV, and this is how the NIV renders this phrase, which, again, all of this is interesting to me. I can tell it's not to you. The tongue, this is how the NIV renders it, the tongue sets the whole course of a man's life on fire. I, and I, I'm not disagreeing with that. I, I believe that that's one of a number of shades of meaning that come into, come into play with this, with this particular phrase. But I don't think, and you would expect this from a simple-minded man, I don't think we ought to be real quick from walking away from the literal rendering of the terms. Think it through with me for just a little bit. The beginning or the birth of a wheel. We actually have an English phrase that's quite popular. I know you've used it that I believe actually corresponds to the Greek here. We often use the phrase... Setting the wheels in what class? Motion. 
I believe God's painting a multifaceted picture as James writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, but don't miss the literal rendering of the terms, which helps us to recognize and appreciate once again that James is absolutely driving home the reality that our words, once they leave our mouth, they travel a particular course of life. It is as if our words, in turn, have a life of their own. Your word sets a wheel in motion. And boy, isn't it interesting to tie that into what is so familiar to us, sadly, and that is the rumor mill. So we know about this. And by the way, we need to keep that as a backdrop as well, because if there's any scenario that we can very quickly picture that reminds us of the destructive force of the words that drop from someone's tongue, like fire, it is the rumor milling that we do. And you and I don't stop to think about this very often. And most of the time, what I'm expressing to you is behind the scenes, and so we're just not privy to it. But, but, but the rumor mill absolutely destroys people. I can't tell you how often I have read of pastors who have literally been destroyed in regard to the ministry that God has given to them because of a rumor. Now, by the way, I'm not standing here and defending pastors because as many of scenarios like that that you would have, they would... That would be supplemented by, by pastors, please continue to pray for me. That would be supplemented by, by uh, pastors uh, where, where it's, it's not a rumor, it's a reality. And, and so I, I understand that. But you do realize with me, right, that men and women and young people's lives have been ruined by a word and sometimes it can be just a single word. And sometimes, even though down the road the word proves to be false, there's still that stigma. Isn't that interesting? It's like it's tied to its own world. Isn't that interesting? As James speaks of our tongue as a world of iniquity. He's reiterating the fact that our words like fire quickly spread and that our words like fire quickly become uncontrollable. Again, James, and I told you I would close with this, is helping us to see the big picture. It's so easy for us to look at the minuteness of our tongue and so easy to consider the smallness of our words. And James says, oh, please understand that the enemy plugs that into an entire world. Please understand that the enemy uses that word and sets the wheels in motion. Please understand that he'll take whatever we give him and make the most of it, not for heaven, but for hell. Let's continue to embrace together the challenge of with Christ controlling our tongue, speaking words that edify, that build up, that are truthful, and that are marked by grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you. The practical instruction continues, and we're not surprised James is famous for that. What an amazing book. What an amazing section as we continue to wade through it and allow you and the Spirit of God through the Word of God to instruct us regarding our tongues. 
I know we have a ways to go, but oh, how pleased you are with us when we embrace as we go, we improve as we go, we get better as we go because we're leaning on you, trusting in you, and depending upon you and your strength so that we can actually control what is otherwise uncontrollable. Help us to please you faithfully in our speech. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.